Welcome to Engedrian. If this is your first time listening, or even if you are returning, be sure to follow us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube for additional content, battle maps, and background details. We hope you are enjoying our adventure. Let's see what happens next. The party, having entered the ancient crypt and begun their mapping, identified that the remains in the sarcophagi are human. But... Disturbing their graves has awakened them. Everyone rolls for initiative. Skeleton E attacks Innocel with a dagger. Rolls 13 for a miss. One of the skeletons tears out of the wrappings binding it, leaps to its feet brandishing a dagger, and charges towards Innocel. It stabs wildly at her, but she blocks it with her shield. Bumgarn moves into melee with Skeleton D and E, attacks Skeleton D with Scimitar and Divine Smite, Attacks Skeleton E with Second Scimitar Swing and Divine Smite. Rolls 22 for a hit versus AC 13 for 7 damage plus 10 Divine Smite. Rolls 23 for a hit for 6 damage plus 16 Divine Smite. Umgarn rushes towards the skeleton's charging Malage and slashes with a scimitar infused with Divine Power, shattering it into hundreds of pieces. He backswings with his scimitar at the second skeleton attacking Innocel, shattering it into hundreds of pieces as well. Ghost appears uses horrifying visage. The party makes DC 13 wisdom saving throws. Roll 6, 12, 5, 12, 20, 19, and 7. The age roll of a 1d4 is 1, equals 10 years aged by the party member if they fail the saving throw by 5 or more. A ghastly form of grayish green... <clears throat> the ghastly form of a grayish green figure appears on the far side of the room, unmoving, staring at the party. It wears a long flowing gown covered in embroidered stars. Around its neck is a necklace of several dozen large gems. Odinus, Innocel, Case, Malage, and Peace are frightened of the creature. Umgern and Theophania are not, recognizing it as a ghost. Odinus, Case, and Peace feel older by at least ten years. Peace attacks Skeleton C with three key enhanced claw attacks, rolls 19 for 9 slashing damage. 15 for 8 slashing damage, and 9 for a miss. Frightened by the ghost, Peace lashes out with slashing claws at the closest skeleton, decapitating it with the first blow, shattering its ribs with the second blow, and then missing with the third as it collapses to a pile of dust. Skeleton A attacks the Ophania with the dagger, rolls 5 for a miss. Another of the exhumed bodies erupts from its wrappings and charges towards the Ophania with a rusty dagger, but she parries the thrust with her longbow. Malage uses Wand of Magic Missiles with 6 charges, rolls 8d4 plus 8 for 29 damage. Malage whips out his Wand of Magic Missiles and fires 8 darts of force energy at the ghost, disrupting its form and causing it to wail loudly. Innocel casts Flaming Sphere, rolls it towards Ghost, forcing a saving throw, rolls 11 fire damage, Ghost rolls 8 dex saving throw, fails. Innocel brandishes her magical quarterstaff, mumbles a few words and gesticulates with her free hand to produce a 5 foot Flaming Sphere in front of her. She then forces the sphere directly at the Ghost, slamming into it, causing it to shimmer, fade slightly, and wail again. Theophania attacks Ghost with Longbow with plus 1 arrow. Rolls 12 versus AC 11, the 12th magical piercing damage. Theophania launches a magical arrow and launches it at the ghost. The head of the arrow pierces the ghost's form and it dissipates completely. Fodinus attacks Skeleton C with Short Sword, Assassinate. Attacks Skeleton A with Short Sword, Sneak Attack. Rolls 23 crit for 16 damage. Rolls 21 for 12 damage. Fodinus charges the skeletons around Theophania, shattering the first with a short sword slash and ripping through the second with his offhand strike, though it's still on its feet. Face attacks Skeleton B with Sphere advantage, rolls 19 for 7 damage. Face, out of melee with the last skeleton, hurls his sphere at its bobbling head, shattering it and collapsing it to the floor. The party receives 200 experience. Malage makes an arcana check, rolls 21. Malage moves quickly around the room to the misty remains of the ghost and the five skeletons. Using his pearl, he collects a residual amount of spiritual essence into the pearl, creating a spirit shard. For the skeletons, he sifts through the remains and finds five pouches worth of bone dust, which he collects in a vial from Innocel. Odinus, Case, and Theophania look through the wrappings of the skeletons and find 350 gold pieces, 4,526 silver pieces, 7,126 copper pieces, 
two magical scrolls, and 41 gems. Malaj also pockets the magic necklace from the skeleton. Inesel gathers the remains as best she can and returns them to the wrappings. The others help her place them back in the crypts and she places flowers, herbs, and shiny stones on the remains. Bodinus and Case replace the tablets on each grave and secure them with pittons. Inesel burns herbs and incense in the cavern to cleanse the area. When she is satisfied, Ungern nods to her and the rest of the party. Inesel makes a perception check. Rolls 25. As they move towards the exits of this section, Inesel pauses. Malaise, can you read this tablet? She points at a slightly more ornate sarcophagus that no one seems to have noticed when they came in. He studies it for a few minutes. It says her name was Calistrian Amatage, and that she was a lonely queen who died with no children. Do you think that was the ghost? I'm not sure, but the ghost was wearing very distinctive clothes and a large necklace. Let's check. NSL steps aside and nods to Case, who opens the tablet carefully. Odinus again assists. Peace and Case remove the body and place it on the floor. Malage opens the wrappings, and there, inside, is the remnants of the long flowing gown with faded stars rotting away. Around the neck is a large platinum necklace with at least six large diamonds and many dozens of smaller stones of various sizes and colors. Ungern walks forward and pulls a handful of silver dust from his bag, says a long litany of holy words, and sprinkles them over the body. He removes his water skin, says additional holy words, and sprinkles the water on the body. He then nods to Malaj, who picks up the necklace carefully. It must be priceless. He places it gently in his bag of holding. Peace walks over to the body, removes a piece of parchment and their ink pen, and recites a poem of love, longing, and loss, which they also write on the parchment. They fold it and place it with the body. Case and Fodinus replace the body after Inesel additionally blesses it and secures the tablet with pitons. I think we've taken quite enough from these people today. Let's finish this mapping and get back to the ship. Inesel strides out of the room quickly. The lizard folk are not too keen on grave robbing. Fodinus winks at Malaj and smiles. Malaj blushes and his hair bursts into embarrassed flames. After another two hours of sending their familiars down corridors and rapidly scribbling out the map, Inesel looks up from the parchment. There are no more unexplored corridors. She smiles and leads the party back towards the spiral staircase. As they approach the staircase from the south, the same grayish-green figure appears at the stairwell to the exit. Unlike before, she shines with a pearlescent light and smiles, her visage is warm and inviting. As the party approaches, she moves forward, smiles broadly, and quickly enters Inesel's body. Thank you for the poem. Thank you for freeing the souls of my brothers and sisters. Many of the souls in this crypt are bound by earthly magical trinkets, a relic of our ancient past. If you return, I beg of you to free my people from their entrapped sleep in this dank crypt. Inesel flutters with a bright white light, and then the visage of the ghost vanishes through the stone ceiling. Inesel recovers and looks at the party. I think it's definitely time to go. She charges up the stairs. The rest of the party follows her. On the surface, they return the stone door to its place, and Fodinus and Case slide a large stone table over the hole in hopes of preventing grave robbers from violating the tomb. As they exit the building, Isvara is near the western horizon. The lonely lady appears in the sky out of a shadow and touches down with the ladder deployed. The party quickly climbs the ladder, and Umgern, again, nods to Captain Fishdwain to take off. But, next to Captain Fishdwain, Umgern sees something peculiar and pauses for a moment to make sure he is sane. Kalia, King of Pathilia, stands next to Captain Fishdwain, and to his right is a cleric in formal robes of the Grand Cathedral of Mysteries in Cantheria. Before Umgern can respond, the cleric rushes forward and begins casting spells on the party. Kalia moves to Umgern and smiles. I thought I would pop in with my dear friend, Bishop Pomeroy of Fesswain. She's here to help you recover from that ghost. Pomeroy casts greater restoration on Fodinus, Case, and Peace. They return to their normal ages, but each has acquired a one-inch shock of gray hair. Uh, how did you get here? Umgern shakes Kalia's hand and stares in amazement. Our king teleported here. Peace stands and holds their paws face up and opened. The king turns around quickly with a smile. You are, as we have all seen, 
all-seeing and all-knowing in this world. Peace bows. Go on. The king moves a few steps back across the deck. You are, if we may posit, a great wizard, no? Kalia bows deeply and smiles. The Hall of Narvandar is a multiverse crossroads. Case and her selves came to Angedrian through some similar magic. Would you, in your infinite wisdom and knowledge, be aware of any such magic that can return us to our homes? The king smiles broadly and walks a few steps closer to the party, who are all now standing and listening intently. Piece of the puzzle. Case, Amber Dream. And Gedrian is in desperate need of your strength and focus for the time being. However, I can personally assure you that, should you wish to return to your home, I can see to it personally. The king bows. Peace, emboldened by the king's generosity, moves a step closer. Have you, sir, been to the Hall of Narvandar yourself? Peace places their paws together, pointed down. I have not had that pleasure or benefit, though... Perhaps one day. The king's face seems suddenly very sullen. Then, let us give you a small gift in return for all that you have done for us. Peace pulls a piece of parchment from their notes. They hand it to the king, who examines it closely. Such a thoughtful and uncommon gift from a kind soul. Thank you very much, Peace. The king bows. He smiles at the party. If you will allow it. I will accompany you back to Pathilia on the three-day journey. I would be delighted to hear all that you have found in the Blight. Everyone bows deeply and nods happily. Kalia smiles and moves to the back of the ship, watching the dark horizon behind as the ship moves towards the setting as Vara. The party moves together down below deck to discuss the sudden change of events. Peace. What was all that stuff you said to the king about? Fodinus looks directly at Peace intently. After observing our king in person twice, and from our conversations that we had around town with many, many different people, it is very clear to us that your king is, in fact, a very powerful wizard, and an uncommonly kind soul. A rare combination in wizards. His appearance on this ship proves it, for he could only have done so by teleportation. The diagram we gave him was of a magic circle in the Hall of Narvandar, which he, of course, knows how to use. The platform we spent our time on was clearly meant for wizards to scribe spells or copy them into a spellbook, though we only used it to catalog much of our life and thoughts. So, we assumed the magic circle scribed on the floor allows wizards to return any time they like, and his acceptance of the gift and his response confirms for us that he is in fact a truly powerful wizard who appreciates it. The party all stare, eyes open, jaws drop. Malaysia begins handing out roasted dragon meat as Peace starts boiling water for tea. On the three-day journey from the Blight to the southern reaches of Pathilius, the party explains their adventures to Kalia in detail. Though there is much repetition and overexcitement about useless details, Kalia is wrapped by their story and pays everyone lip service and kindness for sharing. Although the stories are full of details, Malaysia does not mention, nor does anyone else, the multi-diamond necklace of the ghost, which is merely a forgetful omission and not an intention. As they approach the landing field south of Pathilia, he speaks to them all in a serious tone over afternoon tea, expertly prepared by peace. You have done so well, my children. Proving that the Blight, at least Phila, is habitable, is an enormous boon to Pathilius. We can repopulate the area as soon as possible, despite winter. We must, of course, carefully explore the rest of the Blight. But, if we can move our people there and establish strongholds, thwarting the plans of Sentinel Fuse will be easily accomplished. Kalia pauses and sips a long, slow drink of wine. He looks directly at peace. My feline poet extraordinaire, I know you wish to return to Phila and catalog every tablet in the crypt in detail. I applaud your enthusiasm, and the rubbings are of course proof that this endeavor is of value. And let me assure you, before that tome of knowledge is made public, you will be the sole author to review and approve it. All of you will be named as contributing. But let me be clear. Your enthusiasm aside, I need you to do something much more important for the kingdom. I have droves of brilliant minds who will catalog every inch of Phila and present it for you to review. There are clearly treasures of unspeakable value that I will make sure you are privy to. But your skills are needed in the rest of the Blight. After two Quinn days rest in Pathilia, I beg you return to the Blight and move to Charles, Sanye, Espa, and Persephone as quickly as possible. 
If we can confirm that all of the Blight is safe and habitable, we can reclaim it, fortify it, and secure a new border against Salternal Fuse. It requires a small group with a mixture of talents and not the brute force of my soldiers. Can I beseech you, my friends, to do this for me? Kalia pauses and smiles at the party, arms open, palms up. What about the rogue Mind Flayer, Varkadar? Malaj stands tall, shoulders back, staring intently at Kalia. The rest of the party gasps or sighs at the Genasi's defiance. Malaysia's eyes quickly cut to Fodinus, who has a look of admiration and love glistening in his eyes. That one. Yes. Well, I must confess, little Genasi, Enochrin is more slippery than I thought. She is, in fact, a changeling. We haven't seen her in a while because she assumed a new personality, but she remains in contact with Varkadar, and he continues to pursue his mind control experiments. It is clear his target is me or my closest allies, but he is far from succeeding. For now, please trust me that he is not the most pressing threat. We will have to deal with him, yes? Of course. But today, I think the Blight is more important. Can you trust me? Kalia smiles sadly at Malaj, drops to his knees, and takes the Genasi's hands in his. Malaj smiles with an embarrassed look, his hair flaring, and nods. Excellent. Now, I have a few rewards for all of you for a job well done in Phila, and then I must go. Bodinus, this is for you. Kalia pulls from thin air a leather armor. It's slightly better than what you have now. I hope it fits. Fodinus removes his magical leather armor and replaces it with the new magical armor. He smiles and bows deeply. Fodinus receives studded leather plus two. In a cell, please accept this scimitar made of crystal that provides you with light when all others go out. Enesel takes the scimitar, swings it a few times, and bows to Kalia. Enesel receives a crystal scimitar. Case. A warrior such as yourself cannot be making loud noises when you're trying to sneak up unarmed on the enemy. Though the armor I gave Fudinus is rare, he is rarely at the front lines, so I have saved this very rare armor for you. Case takes the magical studded leather armor, bows to Kalia, and dons the new armor. He smiles at the light weight. Case receives studded leather armor plus three. Malaj, my dear sweet Genasi fire elemental visitor to Pathelia, you are adept with your wand and have done well with it, but I think you could do with something a bit more powerful. Kalia hands him a wand with a metal base and multiple silver branches emerging and fusing into a silver tip. Malaj takes the wand, smiles, and bows deeply. Malaj receives a wand of lightning bolts. Kalia turns to Theophania. You, my most beloved ranger, paragon of your people, refuse me a place in the court. But I know your heart is in the forest. I want you to have this most precious elven bow, which was a gift to my mother from the far elven courts of the north. Kalia hands Theophania a large, slightly glowing bow with dark ebony wood and a humming bowstring. Theophania observes the bow, smiles, and bows. Theophania receives a ranger's deadly longbow plus one. Umgern, the weapon of your people is the hand crossbow. Please have this special weapon as your gift from me. Umgern takes the hand crossbow, replaces his old one with the new one, and bows. Umgern receives a hand crossbow plus two. And peace, my beloved poet. As a wizard, armor is not something I can wear, but I have found these bracers have protected me well. I impart to you these bracers which I believe will serve you well. Peace accepts the bracers, places them on their wrists, and bows deeply. Peace receives bracers of defense. Mm. Now, my friends, I must leave you. Please spend your two Quen days as you wish, resting, recovering, studying, or improving. At the conclusion, the lonely lady will be ready to take you back to the Blight with the same crew plus Sister Milligan from the High Temple in Pathelia in case you run into any more ghosts. If you need me during this time, Ungern knows where to find me. Kalia smiles, walks to the foredeck of the ship, turns, and vanishes. The bishop, who had been standing off to the side, taps a necklace and also vanishes. The ship lands in the launching field, and a carriage meets the party to take them back to Pathelia. When they arrive back in Pathelia, the party reviews their items and treasure and liquidates the non-essentials including the plesiosaurus skin, meat and teeth, bat hides and wings, dragon wings, various weapons and gems, and distributes the returns among the party. Over the next two Quinn days, everyone engages in various downtime activities and rests.
Malage dumps his bag of holding in his tavern room and sees the necklace from the ghost fall out. He gasps, having completely forgotten about it. With this very expensive diamond necklace from the tomb, he visits the local jeweler. He visits the local jeweler to assess its value. Griselda, the most knowledgeable jeweler in Pathelia, who sold Peace the brooch for Fudinus, looks over the necklace carefully. She uses, her, she uses her jeweler's loop for many minutes. After a very long time, she looks up from the piece and smiles at Malage. She pulls a wand from behind the counter, swishes it a few times, and the door of the shop locks tight and the windows go dark. Little one, this is a most impressive piece. I dare say there is nothing in the king's own vaults that would even rival it. I'm afraid, as is, I could not even begin to offer you a price for it. The king of Anbeth might choose to buy this piece for his queen, but other than him, few could afford it. It is hard to say this, but such a piece is too valuable to even be sold on the common market and likely too dangerous to even keep on your person. My suggestion is that you give this to the King of Pathelia for his royal museum collection in return for favors or a reward. Gerselda pauses, smiles, and returns the necklace to Malage. He sighs and puts it in his bag of holding. He pulls the second necklace, the gold chain with the large gem set in a gold setting from his bag and places it on the counter. What about this one? He seems defeated and sad. Griselda looks at the necklace carefully, murmurs a few words, and passes her hands over the chain and gem. Well, this is interesting. The gold and the gem in this one are far more reasonable in price, but the magic is fascinating. Someone, I would guess a cleric or a priest, used this necklace to suppress an angry or violent spirit, but the magic was quite specific. Now I dare to guess this is simply worth its weight in gold and gems, and I would put that at about 3,500 gold pieces. Would that do for you? Malage perks up and smiles. He nods vigorously, and Griselda counts out the coins. Malage also visits Hadrian's heretics and purchases an outright bag of holding for 2,500 gold pieces. He visits the Artificer Guild and pays 2,000 gold pieces to be retrained in his infusions, choosing Homoculus Servant and replicating an alchemy jug to replace his replicating bag of holding and repeating shot. He also acquires, from Hadrian's, 20 plus 1 arrows for his short bow. He visits a jeweler and acquires 15 more chips of obsidian for a very high price. Malage also gives Fodinus 1,000 gold pieces towards the purchase of a manor house outside of Pithilius, which can accommodate all seven party members. With the contract on him expired, Malage performs his street fire juggling every day just after Isvara sets. Malage makes two performance checks, rolls 20 and 11. His first week of performance is stellar as he's never performed in Pithilia and the crowd is fascinated. He earns 55 gold pieces, 64 silver pieces, and 72 copper pieces. The second week, the crowds are thin as it's cold and not much travel is happening, so his performance is not so inviting. He earns 8 gold pieces, 25 silver pieces, and 35 copper pieces. He stays at the Salty Pig, which costs him 75 gold pieces for the two Quinn days, going back and forth between the new manor house. Fodinus shops around with his own money as well as 1,000 gold pieces for each party member to find a manor house that can securely accommodate all of them with sufficient staff to tend to the place in their absence. He is able to locate a nine-bedroom manor that includes a main building, a barn, and a decent servant's quarters on 10 acres of farmland for 21,000 gold pieces. He shares this with the party and, within the first quinde, everyone has moved into their own room which includes a secure storage, bed, bath, and other personal sundries for their comfort. Fodinus spends much of the rest of the week gambling. He wagers 5,000 gold pieces. Fodinus makes an insight check, deception check, and dice skill check for each quinde. Rolls 14, 22, 22 for the first quinde versus 16, 18, and 15. Two successes plus 2,500 gold pieces. Rolls 20, 15, and 18 for the second quinde versus 22, 10, and 7 two successes, 2,500 gold pieces. For the week, he is up 5,000 gold pieces. In addition, he bets on two caged fighting matches for Case to win at 25 to 1 odds for 1,500 gold pieces. Lastly, he asks Hadrian on the first day to try and find him a cloak suitable for his profession and is interested in a cloak of displacement of the bat or of arachnidia. 
He spends 800 gold pieces associating with potential sellers. Bodinus makes a persuasion check, plus 10, with advantage, Roach. Rolls 25, no cloaks. Bodinus gives Hadrian's another 800 gold pieces and asks them to continue looking for the next couple of Quin days, and he will check back with them later. Bodinus visits the rogue's den in Pithilia and reviews the contracts available. The contract for Malage appears to have been removed or revoked, and he learns from the din master that the contract was cancelled. There are four contracts available at the moment, which include two prominent businessmen, which Fodinus determines is more competitive rivalry and not his style. There is a third contract for a monk named Seraph Silverwind, who is spending her days educating street urchins, which Fodinus knows many thieves try to recruit as pickpockets. He takes note of the target's name and likely location. The last contract is for Donatello the Butcher Moretti, a local half-orc crime lord who has been pushing into other territories and disrespecting the code of rogues. Odinus knows Donatello well as they are bitter enemies. He accepts the contract. On a bright, sunny afternoon, he finds Seraph easily down in the squalor where there are several housing developments and soup kitchens sponsored by the king. She is a delightful young woman who seems to glow with an inner radiance. Odinus approaches her with his hand out. Hello there, I am Fodinus Oradirk. I understand you are working with the children? Several small children listening to Seraph look up from their pieces of parchment and smile at Fodinus. He chucks them all a gold piece. Well, hello back, sir. I'm Seraph Silverwind, and yes, I'm trying to help these children learn so they can have better lives. She nods and looks back to the children. Fodinus walks close to her and whispers in her ear. You've made some enemies that want you dead. Does this bother you? He carefully breathes deeply, smelling her lustrous golden hair, which has a scent of lilac and roses. Yes, it's actually Lucas Morgan, a tiefling with the constable's office. You may know that he recruits these children to pick pockets. She whispers back to Fodinus. Very blatantly, she also breathes very deeply and smiles. You smell like... adventure. Fodinus blushes a deep purple. He shakes his head and furrows his brow. Lucas is actually well known to me. We are, in fact, not friends. I'd prefer he were no longer working in Pathelia. He smiles knowingly and looks at the children who are all staring blankly at the pair. I'll make a deal with you, Fodinus. If you can find Lucas another job, I'll let you take me to dinner. Fodinus blushes an even deeper shade of purple and laughs nervously. Deal. He turns towards the children, throws them a handful of gold, and walks away. Fodinus gives away twenty gold pieces. Later that evening, Fodinus dons his darkest clothes and shades his daggers black with his command word. He waits outside of Donatello's main business where he always had drinks at the end of the night. Donatello lives a few blocks away and, filled with liquor and confidence, he often walks home alone without heavies. Fodinus stands in a dark shadow, invisible to anyone passing by. After more than two hours of waiting, Donatello appears out of a side door. He has a female elf with him, and they are walking close together. Fodinus makes a perception check. Rolls 13. The female elf looks very familiar to him, but he can't quite place her face. She wears a skin-tight red leather pant and a flowing red silk blouse. Her hair is tied in a high bun with a gold pin in the front. He can almost remember her name, but it escapes him. The pair move down the main street, which is well lit by oil lamps. Fodinus knows they have to turn down an alley two streets up to make it to Donatello's house, halfway down the alley. He ducks down his own alley, sprints to one street over, and races up to the opposite end of Donatello's alley. Fodinus makes a stealth check. Advantage, Roach. Rolls nine. Despite the darkness of the hour and his dark dress, Fodinus runs past a small tavern as the door is opening, flooding him with light and causing him to run into the door. Hey, watch it, Speedy. A very drunk halfling supporting an even more drunk gnome holds up his fist in anger. Fodinus makes it to the alley and slips into the shadows again, moving as close as he can to Donatello's door. Fodinus makes a stealth check. Advantage, brooch. Rolls 22. The darkness and silence of the alley shrouds him in ebony stealth. He pulls both daggers from their scabbards on his back and holds them at the ready. Donatello and the elf turn the corner and walk towards the door, which is illuminated only by a lamp from inside. There are no windows on either side of the alley. As Donatello reaches the door, he turns to the elf and gives her a long, deep kiss. Fodinus chooses this moment to strike. Fodinus attacks Donatello with dagger, 
Assassinate, Sneak, and Surprise. Rolls 23 versus AC 18 for a hit for 40 damage. Odinus slides his dagger to Donatello's throat and pushes his opposite forearm against the back of his neck, slicing through the half-orc's throat to the spinal bones. The half-orc drops, spraying blood all over the elf. Odinus attempts to grapple elf. Rolls 22 critical versus 17. Elf is grappled. Odinus slides behind the elf before the scream erupts from her mouth and covers her face with one arm while grabbing her chest tightly with the other. Who are you? He whispers very quietly close to her ear. She huffs and fights briefly, then seems to relax. When he is confident she isn't going to scream, he removes his arm from her mouth and places his dagger on her throat. Cassandra Blackthorn. She almost sobs the words. Odinus, however, smiles. Cassandra is a casino owner in Pendigen, where her specialty is cheating soldiers out of their pay by offering them free carnal services if they gamble on their payday. Odinus observed the casino for two quin days and determined how she was fixing the games to rake in the soldiers' hard-won wages. He brought it to the attention of the local authorities and confronted Cassandra with it. But one of the local authorities was in on the scheme, and Fodinus barely escaped Pendigen with his life. He currently is unable to travel there in the open because of a standing order by Cassandra to bring her his head. Fodinus attacks Elf with dagger. Assassinate, sneak, surprise. Rolls 27 critical for 25 damage. With much less force than was needed for Donatella, Fodinus slices Cassandra's throat quickly, dropping her next to her would-be lover. He cuts a leather bag from Donatello's neck, the required bounty mark, and quickly searches their bodies. He finds 110 gold pieces between the two of them, three gold bracelets, a gold necklace, a gold hairpin, two steel daggers, and a set of skeleton keys. Fodinus pockets the items except for the keys. He quickly uses the keys to open the door to the house and extinguishes the lamp, plunging the alley into total darkness. Fodinus makes an investigation check. Roll 7. At first glance, Fodinus sees a simple parlor with a door off the back to what looks like a bedroom and a small kitchen off the parlor. He takes about 10 minutes to do a more thorough search and finds a trap door in the kitchen which leads to a deep cellar. He drags both bodies to the cellar and moves them to a far corner. There are several barrels of salt which he uses to cover the bodies and then throws several piles of oilcloth and burlap over them. Finally, he moves a large cask of wine and a half-empty salt barrel on top of them. Back upstairs, he searches the house thoroughly. In the bedroom, behind a painting of Donatello on a gray horse leading a charge of orcs into battle, he finds a wall safe. Bodinus makes a thieves tools check. Advantage, Roach. Rolls 22. After a moment of manipulation, the safe opens. Fodinus grabs everything in the safe and dumps it into his bag of holding without paying much attention. In the rest of the house, he finds a few gold trinkets and some silver candlesticks, which he takes to make the whole scene look like a robbery. Satisfied, he exits, locks the door with the key, and then drops it in the sewer grate. Later in the Quinn day, Fodinus learns Lucas Morgan's work schedule and arranges to be in one of the alleys near his home after he finishes a late shift. As the evening drifts into night, Lucas comes into view. As expected, he is alone and wanders aimlessly, observing everyone and everything around him. Fodinus makes a stealth check versus Lucas' perception check. Roll 16 versus 7. Despite being curious or nosy, Lucas has no indications that Fodinus stands in the darkness in the alley. The door to his home is on the front of the building, where Fodinus hides in the alley on the side. As Lucas unlocks the door to go inside, Fodinus slides in behind him, pushes him through the door, and closes it behind him. There are no lights on inside, but they can both easily see in the dark. Fodinus, Oradek, what brings you to my humble abode? Lucas folds his arms across his chest, each hand holding a nasty steel dagger with curved blades and long, thin, sharp points. Fodinus' daggers are also in his hands, but at his sides. I want you to cancel the contract on Seraph Silverwind. Now. Fodinus makes an intimidation check versus Lucas' insight check. Rolls 12 versus 19. Lucas bursts out laughing and smiles. Are you trying to scare me, bugbear? Consider it a polite request if that suits you, but the contract will be cancelled. Fodinus moves a step closer to Lucas with his daggers poised in his crossed arms. I'll make a deal with you, Fodinus. You convince Seraph to return to whatever bastion of goodness she arose from, and I will cancel the contract. Lucas moves casually over to a large fluffy chair and sits down. 
He places his daggers on a small table and sits back. That doesn't seem like such a good deal to me, Lucas. How about this counteroffer? You take your operations to Candle Port or Exilia and leave Pathelia behind. Forever. Odinus takes a slightly less fluffy chair across from Lucas, but keeps his daggers in his hands, crossed on his lap. Convil Port or Exilia, and why, pray tell, would I do that? Because the alternative is that you cease operations and breathing permanently. Odinus leans forward and with a swift kick knocks Lucas's daggers into the air briefly. They clatter back onto the table and fall onto the floor at his feet. I'll have your answer now. You've made a lot of enemies, Fodinus. I am among them. I've met a few. What's to say I just don't have a nice hefty contract put on your life, or maybe my friends will do it if something happens to me? Lucas smiles and stares intently at Fodinus, unblinking. Actually, you just gave me a great idea, Lucas. Why don't you go to Pendigen and take over the casino there? My understanding is that their current owner is out of sorts. Fodina stares back, unblinking. Cassandra? <laughs> I just saw her at the racing Starling two nights ago, getting cozy with Donatello, the owner. If anything, she's probably going to open a casino here. That would be bad for you. I hear you're not allowed in Pendigen anymore. Lucas laughs and casually bends over and picks up his dagger. When he sits up, Fodinus is next to his chair with both daggers pressed to his throat. I will tell you this because I think you'll keep the secret. Donatello and Cassandra are sleeping permanently in his cellar. Fodinus attacks with two daggers, assassinate, sneak, surprise. Rolls 23 and 22 for 43 damage. Lucas drops his daggers and reaches for his throat, but has exsanguinated before he can even place his hands on the wounds. He slumps over on his chair, dead. Still in darkness, Fodinus searches the house thoroughly. He finds a small chest under the bed in the bedroom. Fodinus makes a thieves' tools check and a traps check. Rolls 28, critical, and 22. The chest does not have any traps or hidden surprises. He opens it easily and sees a pile of gold, platinum, and gems, and a leather parchment bag that contains a stack of folded papers. He dumps the contents in his bag of holding. Unlike Donatello's, where hiding the bodies was to delay suspicion and destroy evidence, but under contract, he's not going to be paid much for ending Lucas, aside from maybe a date. He tosses the place, searching for anything of value to make the robbery scene look more realistic. Lucas, despite being networked to a large number of child pickpockets, doesn't seem to keep much of value in his home outside of the chest. He finds a few papers with Lucas's handwriting and pauses to think. From a small writing desk, he takes some parchment and a pen. Odinus makes a forgery check. Disadvantage. Rolls 13. Although the handwriting is not a perfect match, the form and content seem appropriate for a last will and testament. He places the will in the chest and relocks it. When he leaves, he makes sure the front door is locked then darts back down the darkened alley. Later that evening, he empties the bag of holding and sorts through the safe and chest contents. From Donatello, he finds records of his criminal activities, including contracts, dates and places, names of businesses and citizens he is extorting, and a hit list of people he wants out of the way. Fodinus notes that his name is on the list towards the bottom. Lastly, he finds the deeds to the racing starling, the madam's repose, and luxurious leathers, the three main businesses that he runs all of his criminal operations out of. Fodinus sets all of Donatello's documents aside. In Lucas's documents, he finds a list of names, likely of children, with notes about them, including their gambits and where they hang out or sleep. A few of the names have an amount of gold pieces written next to the name, and the name is crossed out. Another document appears to be the deed for his home and a deed for a farm outside of town. He sets those aside. All totaled, the other items from the safe and the chest includes 129 platinum pieces, 4,532 gold pieces, and 10 gems, including a tiny eye agate, a brownish green garnet, a huge deep purple amethyst, a huge muddy blue star sapphire, a muddy green zircon, a huge chipped light green jade, a small black pearl, a huge pink pearl, a tiny blue azurite, and a pale green tourmaline. He separates the gems into a pile with the jewelry and daggers. He sits back from the four piles and thinks. Fodinus makes an intelligence check. Rolls 20 critical. Far from his normal line of thinking, Fodinus has a moment of pure clarity and determines a brilliant plan. He gathers up all of the deeds and puts them in one pile. 
He gathers all of the criminal evidence and places it in a separate pile. He places the deeds in the leather parchment bag and wraps all of the evidence documents in a piece of loose parchment that he folds and seals with wax. Checking the hour, which is very late, he gathers everything and heads back out. His first stop is Lucas's house, which is still dark as he left it. He replaces the leather parchment bag in the chest along with the leather bag from around Donatello's neck and puts some gold and a few gems inside. Vodinus gives away 200 gold pieces, a muddy green zircon, a huge chipped light green jade, and a small black pearl. He reseals the chest, places it back under the bed, and rearranges the room back to order. He puts both of the daggers in Lucas's hands and passes the blades through the wounds of his neck, covering them in blood. He leaves the house and goes by the constable's office where Lucas is stationed. The building is locked because anyone on duty is patrolling at this hour. Fodinus makes a thieves' tools check. Rolls 28, critical. Fodinus easily opens the door and slips inside. On the constable's desk, he places the packet of evidence and writes on a blank piece of parchment a brief but detailed enough confession by Lucas of his long-term dealings with Donatello and how it ended a few nights ago when Lucas was forced to murder him and his consort. Satisfied with a sufficient trail of confusing evidence, Fodinus exits, locks the door, and heads to his fence. Even at this hour, a fence is always available, and within a few short minutes of discussing the goods, mostly the gems and jewelry, he receives 4,930 gold pieces, but keeps the giant blue sapphire. His stay at the Salty Pig costs 75 gold pieces for the two Quinn days, going back and forth between the new manor house. Theophania accepts a short contract from the local rangers' guild to survey some of the forests north of Pathelia. At the guild, she pays 2,000 gold pieces to retrain her learned spells to jump, longstrider, and suffer strike, as her new bow allows her to cast Hunter's Mark, Ensnaring Strike, and Hail of Thorns by ex expending its charges. She contributes 1,000 gold pieces to the manor house. During her contract, she meets several other rangers, none of which are centaurs, and they mentor her for being a member of the Rangers Guild. She becomes a probationary member, able to join as a full member when she is a bit more powerful. As a probationary member, she is given a small metal insignia brooch to wear on her clothes, which will alert other rangers to her potential for membership. She visits Hadrian's heretics and negotiates having her short swords upgraded to be magical for a cost of 2,000 gold pieces. She spends most of the days and nights when she is not in the forest with Innocel discussing her surveys and what Innocel has learned from her expeditions into the woods. After the two Quinn days, she has paid 100 gold pieces for her contract. Her stay in the Salty Pig costs 75 gold pieces for the two Quinn days going back and forth between the new manor house. Case has quite a bit of gold at the start of the first Quinn day and has Malaysia help him also purchase a bag of holding for 2,500 gold pieces. He checks in with the caged fighting matches and the fight master only has two fights lined up for him which he confesses are going to be pretty tough. Case agrees to accept both matches for 150 gold pieces each plus 300 gold pieces if he wins. Fodinus, Malage, and Peace all go with him to the arena for both nights of the fights. Only Fodinus bets and did a progressive bet of two victories for Case and the odds of 25 to 1 for 1500 gold pieces. The fight organizer is very unhappy with Fodinus's bet but accepts it because he is confident his two fighters will be too much for Case. Case enters the ring with the first opponent, Mongo Gravehide, a half-orc, who stands at least a foot taller than the man-lion and has shoulders twice as wide. He wears only a rough hide kilt with a large leather belt. The crowd is hushed as the match begins. Case throws the first punch, landing a solid strike against Mongo's jaw. Mongo laughs and swings back immediately, stunning Case with a blow to his head. Case takes a few deep breaths to regain his composure and roars with a surge of energy. He leaps onto Mongo to grapple him but slides off the Hulk's back. Behind him, he tries for a solid kidney blow, but it feels like striking iron. Mongo swings around and pummels Case again in the ribs. Case stumbles back a bit and takes a half-hearted swing, but only find Mongo's hands grasping his own. Mongo attempts to punch him with his opposite hand, but Case likewise grabs it. They push off of each other. They exchange another round of weak swings that both miss. Case throws another punch to Mongo's stomach, but the half-orc sidesteps and brings his elbow down on Case's back very hard. Case stumbles away and then rushes back with a solid punch that seems to bounce off Mongo's ribs. The half-orc returns the swing, but Case steps back, avoiding the blow easily. As Mongo swings, Case notices a scar along Mongo's left ribs that he hadn't noticed before. The man-lion smiles and leaps at the half-orc, slamming his fist into the left rib spot. 
Mongo howls with pain and misses with his return punch. Case quickly assaults the half-orc with two more punches to the head, one of which is matched by a punch from Mongo, sending Case reeling backwards. They exchange another round of weak swings. Mongo closes his eyes tightly and blinks a few times. Case smiles and again leaps into the air, landing a punch to Mongo's throat. As the half-orc tries to return the swing, Case bounds over his shoulders, lands, and waits for Mongo to turn to face him. When he does, he sends an uppercut into the half-orc's chin, which drops him to the caged floor. The crowd goes wild, and Case can hear Peace near Fodinus yelling over the crowd. The second match occurs a few days later. Case enters the ring to see a four-armed Yanti named Zelizia that seems to be made of muscle, stretching and sliding around the cage anxiously. With four arms to contend with, Case decides to take the initiative when the fight begins, leaping high in the air and bringing his elbow down on the Yanti's shoulder. Caught off guard, the Yanti swings back wildly but misses. Case dances around the Yanti and then leaps on its back, locking two of its arms in a grapple with one of his. The Yanti manages to land a punch with a free hand, but only lightly. Now with an advantage, Case pummels the snake man with another solid blow to the neck. Zelizia lands another blow as well. Case, still holding on, takes a deep breath and roars with a surge of energy. He throws two hard punches in a row, but it's off balance with the Yanti's thrashing and misses for both. The snake man's own punches are wild from the thrashing as well. They exchange four rounds of weak swings as the Yanti continues to spin, trying to throw off the man lion. Suddenly, the snake man hisses loudly and flexes all four of his arms, throwing Case off his back and onto the ground. They charge at each other, both landing a blow, but Case seems to take the snake man off balance. Case proceeds to land three punches in a row, only countered by one solid hit from Zelizia. After several more rounds of weak punches, Case leaps into the air and swings down on the Yanti's head when it was trying to shake off the previous blow, and the snake man drops to the ground unconscious. The crowd explodes with excitement. Case receives 900 gold pieces for two matches and two victories. Fodinus receives 3,750 platinum pieces. After the second match, Peace escorts Case back to the tavern and cleans him up, feeds him, gives him a cup of calming tea, and puts him to bed. They sit by the bed all night and read while watching Case sleep. Case spends every morning of the two Quinn days in front of the tavern exercising, usually with Peace present. Case makes two athletics checks, rolls 8 and 14. The crowds are pretty thin due to the weather the first Quinn day, However, after his victory in the caged matches, a few additional admirers pay him a visit in the morning. Case receives 68 gold pieces, 43 silver pieces, and 460 copper pieces. Case spends 2,000 gold pieces with the local cartographer's guild to study with them for a few hours every afternoon for the full two Quinn days, practicing with his tools and studying old and new maps of Pithilia. He gives Fodinus 1,000 gold pieces towards the manor house. Case gains proficiency in cartographer's tools. Inesel travels with Theophania to the forests north of Pithilia on her first day, and then spends the entire Quinde in the forest, learning or perfecting her wild shapes, gathering flowers, herbs, and shiny stones, making potions of healing, and working with Sister to scout around the forest both in and out of her wild shapes. Inesel makes 20 potions of healing for 1,000 gold pieces. She revisits the spider's nest where Fodina's sister's items were found and spends many hours over several days with sister and wild shaped into a giant spider, asking them about the remains. Inesel makes a persuasion check, rolls 11. Despite her best efforts, Inesel can learn very little from the spiders, but feels confident after several discussions that the bugbear is actually still alive because the spiders insist that the items were on the body of a male human. However, where she could be is impossible to know. She manages to connect with the Circle of the Moon Druids in the wilds of Pithilia and spends several evenings with them. She provides them with 2,000 gold pieces worth of reagents and supplies, and they, in return, help her retrain her basic magical spells to be more in line with her needs going forward. Inesel learns Gust, Shape Water, and Mold Earth. When Inesel returns to Pithilia, she discusses what she's learned about Fodinus' sister, which makes him very happy but confused and concerned. Inesel offers him comfort and assurance. Malaysian and Peace, who are also present for the conversation, suggest that perhaps the Mind Flayers or Kalia can help. Fodinus agrees, but decides it is not critically important at the moment. He confesses that he doesn't know this sister, had already assumed she was dead, and, if he gets his hopes up, he will be further crushed. Everyone nods in understanding. Umgern, delighted by the gift from Kalia, 
manages to find some magical crossbow bolts at Hadrian's and adds them to his repertoire of equipment. He also purchases one of Hadrian's last bags of holding. Umgren receives 10 plus 1 crossbow bolts and a bag of holding for 2600 gold pieces. Umgern works with the local constable for the two Quinn days and spends several days investigating a double murder-suicide of a local crime boss, a crooked casino owner, and a corrupt city guard. He concludes after reviewing all of the evidence that the city guard, disgruntled with his relationship with the crime boss, murdered him and his girlfriend, stole property from the crime boss's home, and then, feeling guilty or remorse, turned over all of the evidence to the constable and killed himself. The city guard left a last will and testament leaving all of his possessions to the king's charity for the local street urchins. Based on the incriminating evidence, it appears to Umgern that part of the city guard's corruption was selling some of the children, but not enough information was found to understand what happened to them. The constable congratulated Umgern on a job well done and pays him for working the two Quinn days. Umgern receives 75 gold pieces. Umgern gives Fodinus 1,000 gold pieces towards the manor house. When he hands it to him, he pulls him to the side in a quiet corner of the tavern. So, interestingly, three people that I am pretty sure I remember discussing with you at some point in the past as being the bitter enemies of yours all turned up dead recently. Donatello, Cassandra, and Lucas. Seems they didn't like each other very much. I guess that should make you feel a little more comfortable, eh? Fodinus gathers a rather perplexed look on his face and slowly shakes his head. Fascinating. They honestly haven't crossed my mind in ages. Terrible how these criminals can just have it in for each other. Fodinus smiles and leaves the tavern. Umgern smiles in his wake. Never will admit the good you did because it's always drenched in blood, bugbear. Umgern laughs out loud. Thank you for visiting Engedrian. Don't forget to find us on Facebook, X, formerly Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube for additional content, battle maps, and background details. We hope you're enjoying our adventure. We can't wait to hear what happens next.